And I love those readings. It's beautiful. I, it's good to have, like, it's good to not just have to come up without any poetry to prepare the room. Um, yeah, we all, I mean, I came down from San Francisco, and Lord knows where you all came from, and now here we are, under this chandelier, the ski lodge, <laughs> ready to do some damage. Um, yeah. Those, those poems you read made me really like poetry. <laughs> you know, like reading it. Because usually I don't feel like re like the moment before reading is the moment of heightened, intense dread and <laughs> not feeling like it. Um, but then I felt like it. So, thank you. Um, so I'm going to read some poems from this book, uh, Come On All You Ghosts. And then I'm going to actually just finish a new book. Um, it's called Sun Bear. Uh, yeah, people, I say that thinking that people are going to know that it's a kind of bear. It's an actual kind of bear. I don't know, maybe you all know that. All right. Some people are, don't know that. So, so it's called Sun Bear, and um, yeah, I'll read new poems from that book, and then that'll be it. Um, so this is the first poem. It's called, uh, it's called April Snow. April Snow. Today in El Paso, all the planes are asleep on the runway. The world is in a delay. All the political consultants drinking whiskey keep their heads down, lifting them only to look at the beautiful, scarred waitress who wears typewriter keys as a necklace. They jingle when she brings them drinks. Outside the giant plate glass windows, the planes are completely covered in snow. It piles up on the wings. I feel like a mountain of cell phone chargers. Each of the various faiths of our various fathers keeps us only partly protected. I don't want to talk on the phone to an angel. At night, before I go to sleep, I am already dreaming of coffee, of ancient generals, of the faces of statues, each of which has the eternal expression of one of my feelings. I examine my feelings without feeling anything. I ride my blue bike on the edge of the desert. I am president of this glass of water. This next poem begins, it's one of those poems where the title goes into the poem, it's advanced. Poetry techniques. <laughs> yeah, I had to do that. <laughs> Careful. Um, and it mentions the 9th century Tang Dynasty poet Tu Fu. There were two great, uh, there were two great, well, there were a lot of great 9th century Tang Dynasty poets, but the two of the greatest were Li Po and Tu Fu. And Li Po was like the, he was the kind of joyful, full of negative capability one who would like, get drunk and then fall into a lake, you know, kissing his own reflection, and he was, and then Tufu was the heavy dude with the family who was like always looking, worried about his job and stuff, and um, so you can imagine which one I identified more with, so, um, so this is for Tufu, so, and it's called After Reading Tufu, I Emerge from a Cloud of Falseness. After reading Tufu, I emerge from a cloud of falseness wearing a suit of light. It's too easy to be strange. I glow reading a few pages of an ancient Chinese poet to calm me, but soon I'm traveling down terrible roads like an insect chased by golden armies. Then I'm tired in a little boat filling with smoke. Then in the seasonably cold morning, I'm once again missing my friends. Some have been sent to the capital to take their exams or work for a while or be slowly executed. I cannot help them. I'm trying to build a straw hut beside the transparent river. The sky is a perfect black dome with stars that look white but are actually slightly blue. I have two precious candles to last me a night that has suddenly come. I feel the lives of cities drift through me. I'm a beautiful scroll 
on which the history of a dynasty has been written in a dead language not even one lonely scholar knows. I see sad, crushed plastic everywhere and put some thoughts composed of words that do not belong together together and feel a little digital hope. Um, somebody earlier, uh, when I was visiting um, Jenny's class, asked me uh, about the poetry bus. The poetry bus was a um, long trip I was on, uh, on a bus where we were reading poetry. Uh, 50 cities in 50 days. Um, and I wrote this poem on the poetry bus when I was in uh, Gallup, New Mexico. They have a famous hotel there. They have a very famous hotel there, which is like uh, each of the rooms is is a uh, themed after like a like a silent movie star theme. It's very it's cool. It's worth a trip. I mean, I don't know if it's worth a trip. But it's <laughs> like, in the area. It's worth saying. <laughs> Let's not go crazy. Okay, um, this poem is called A Glow. A Glow. Hello everyone. Hello you. Here we are under this sky. Where were you Tuesday? I was at the El Rancho Motel in Gallup. Someone in one of the nameless rooms was dying. Slowly the ambulance came, just another step towards the end. An older couple asked me to capture them with a the camera. Gladly I rose and did, and then back to my chair. I thought of Paul Salon, one of those poets everything happened to strangely as it happens to everyone. In German, he wrote, he rose three pain inches above the floor. I don't understand, but I understand. Did writing in German make him a little part of whoever set in motion the chain of people talking who pushed his parents under the blue grasses of the Ukraine? No. My name is Ukrainian, and Ukrainians killed everyone but six people with my name. Do you understand me now? It hurts to be part of the chain and feel rusty and also a tiny squeak now part of what makes everything go. People talk a lot. The more they do, the less I remember in one of my rooms, someone is always dying. It doesn't spoil my time is what spoils my time. No one can know what they've missed, least of all my father who was building a beautiful boat from a catalog, and might still be. Sometimes I feel him pushing a little bit on my lower back, with a palm made of ghost orchids and literal wind. Today I'm holding on to, holding on to, what Nico Case called that teenage feeling. She means one thing, I mean another. I mean to say that just like when I was 13, it has been a hidden pleasure, but mostly an awful pain, talking to you with a voice that pretends to be shy and actually is, always in search of a question that might make you ask me one in return. This poem is called Schwinn. Schwinn, I hate the phrase inner life, my attic hurts, <laughs> and I'd like to quit the committee for naming tornadoes. Do you remember how easy and sad it was to be young and defined by our bicycles? My first was yellow, and though it was no black phantom or stingray, but merely a varsity, I loved the afternoon it was suddenly gone chasing its apian flash through the neighborhoods with my father in vain. Like being in a nuclear family in a television show, totally unaffected by a distant war. Then we returned to the green living room to watch the no-names hold our over-the-hill gang under the monotinted, chromatic, defeated Super Bowl waters. 1973. 
Year of the black fly caught in my jello. Year of the suffrage building on K Street Northwest, where a few minor law firms mingle proudly with the union of butchers and meat cutters. A black hand already visits my father in sleep, moving up his spine to touch his amygdala. I will never know a single thing anyone feels, just how they say it, which is why I am standing here exactly, covered in shame and lightning, doing what I'm supposed to do. Sign. <laughs> but you hate it when people like. You ever seen a reading where a person's like they page to their book? Like, just there's so many good options. Fucking <laughs> 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 pick one. <laughs> Never to return. Today, a ladybug flew through my window. I was reading about the snowy plumage of the willow ptarmigan and the song of the Nashville warbler. I was reading the history of weather, how they agreed at last to disagree on cloud categories. I was reading a chronicle of the boredom that called itself the great loneliness and caused a war. I was reading mosquitoes rode to Hawaii on the same ship that brought the eucalyptus to California to function now as a terrible fire accelerator. Next to me, almost aloud, a book said, Doctors can already transplant faces. Another said, you know January can never be June, so why don't you sleep, little candle? A third one murmured, some days are too good. They had to have been invented in a lab. I was paging through a book of unsent postcards. Some blazed with light. Others were a little dim, as if someone had breathed on the lens. In one, it forever snowed on a city known as the Emerald in Embers. The sun had always just gone behind the mountains, never to return, and glass buildings over the harbor stayed filled with a sad, green, unrelated light. The postcard was called The Window Washers. In handwriting it said, someone left an important window open. At night, the black wasp flew in and laid on the sill and died. Sometimes I stop reading and find long black hairs on my keyboard. I would like you to know that in 1992, I mixed Clairol dye number two with my damaged bleached hair to create a blue-green never seen before. <laughs> my best look, according to the girl at the counter who smiled only once. 
I know less than I did before, and I live on a hill where the wind steals music from everything and brings it to me. This poem is called Poem Without Intimacy. Poem Without Intimacy. The other day I was shopping in one of those giant, incredibly brightly lit stores you can apparently see from space, wheeling a massive empty cart, thinking, this is a lot like thinking, why do I go to sleep not having brushed my teeth? and dream of the giant failure known as high school again. <laughs> On the loudspeaker was a familiar song by Quicksilver Messenger Service. There were no lyrics, but I remember it says we are all skyscrapers under one blue rectangle that never chose us to be these sentinels who imperceptibly sway and watch people far below like tiny devices no one controls enter our various sunlit glass conversations. The world is old and full as it will always be of commerce and its hopeful non-profit mitigations. Future products from the Amazon will cure ailments we have and also ones not yet invented. Looking down, I saw my cart was full of a few boxes of some cereal I do not recognize four flashlights, and a pink plastic water bottle made of some kind of vegetable that will eventually, like me, into the earth, harmlessly decompose. And then I passed an entire row of plastic flowers and wanted to be the sort of person who bought them all. But really, I am a runway covered in grass, and all I truly love is sleep. Um, this poem is called Aubergine, which apparently is a color. <laughs> Some of you know this. I did not know that. Um, but in the course of the poem, I discover this important fact. <laughs> Aubergine. I lie in bed staring at the ceiling. Last night, before I fell asleep, I put the book on the floor. Looking down, I see its spine with the golden, simple name of the old poet who might already be dead. Somehow he used ancient magic, everyone says we don't need anymore, to place inside me that perfect sadness. At last, after all the formal words of love, I could really imagine how terrible someday, not for fifty years or so, but still, for one of us to say goodbye, it will be. Again, fear that is almost seasickness, and also surely irrational hope. By that time, I will in some way feel ready, through me moves. And then asleep again, I'm wearing a dead rich man's black luxurious overcoat. Gold buttons. It is snowing in a vast wooden hallway. I am not cold. Someone laughing says, just watch them learn the same lessons. He means my children I don't have yet. I touch the head of a very important black goat and wake up again. The clock radio says a small tremor shook some part of the desert no one lives in. Tiny drones, we are flown by what we do not know into blue election season. Inevitable spells are cast by warlocks. They move their hands, and factories rise or stadiums into dust collapse. 8.10 a.m. December, San Francisco, rainy season. You pull on your boots. I call them purple. The label says aubergine. You leave for work, and by a jolt of atavistic sadness electrified, I move once again to the impassive black desk to clock in for my eternal internship at the venerable, multinational, not-for-profit, <laughs> lucid and dreaming.
I'll read the title poem of this book, Sun Bear. I mentioned earlier it was an actual <laughs> Sun Bear. It's very liberating just to write, just say it. <laughs> Sun Bear. Thought I would share that with you. <laughs> Sun Bear. Yesterday at the Oakland Zoo, I was walking alone for a moment, past the enclosure holding the sun bear, also known as Barawang Madu. It looked at me without interest. It has powerful jaws and truly loves honey. It sleeps in a high hammock. Its claws look made out of wood. And if it dreams at all, it is of Malaysia, home of its enemy, the clouded leopard a gorgeous, arboreal, hunting and eating machine whose coat resembles a python. Now it is night and the zoo is closed. Some animals are sleeping, the nocturnals moving in their cages, getting ready to hunt nothing. I don't know why, but I feel sure something has woken the sun bear. It is awake in the dark. Maybe it is my spirit animal. I'm reading about the early snow that has fallen on the Northeast, all the power shutting down, the weather going insane. The animals cannot help us. They go on moving without love, though we look into their eyes and feel sure we see it there. And maybe we are right. Nothing can replace animal love, not even complicated human love. We sometimes choose to allow ourselves to be chosen by, despite what everyone knows the problem is. In order to love anything but an animal, you cannot allow yourself to believe in those things that are, if we don't stop them, going to destroy us. So, you probably don't know this musician, Jason Molina. Does anybody know him? It's a band called the Magnolia Electric Company. Passed away. Young guy. <coughs> so anyway, this is a poem for another, for a different singer who I, who I love very much, who also died, um, Vic Chestnut. Um, his own life, uh, you know, a year or so ago. Um, I can't find the poem. Oh, here it is. Um, but I like when I play the poem, I'm going to read a few more, so just read, read a couple more, but I like when I, when I um, read this poem to play just a little bit, of his, little bit of his music, because a lot of people aren't necessarily familiar with it, so... Um, called American Singer. That's in memory of Big Chestnut. American Singer. When I walk to the mailbox holding the letter that fails to say how sorry I am, you feel your call or any words at all. On that day would have stopped the great singer who long ago decided more quickly through to move. I notice probably because you wrote that strange word funeral the constant black fabric, I think, is taffeta, always draped over the scaffolds. The figures scraping paint are wearing dusty protective suits and to each other saying nothing. 
I move invisibly like a breeze around three men wearing advanced, practically weightless jackets, impervious to all possible weather, even a hurricane. I hear them say something German, then photograph the pale blue turrets that floating up in fog seem noble heads full of important thoughts, like what revolution could make us happy? From some window, wandering horns. He was three when I was born. For a long time, I had no ideas. My father worked in a private office, full of quiet people working. I came to visit. It seemed correct. I went to college, studied things, dyed my hair, felt a rage disguised as love, kept escaping, suffering only a few broken bones. Everything healed. Now I live in California, where in some red and golden theater, I saw him howl such unfathomable force from only one lung. It was one of his last shows. In Athens once, many years ago, we shared a cigarette, a little smoke from our faces. I can't remember so many things, but see him in his wheelchair, his folded body, it's all gone, but for electrons, I can still push into my ears. I choose the song, the perfect one. Hear his words and see the mirror in the ancient lighthouse blinking. Brave ships, somehow you cross the water, carrying what we need. You can rest, light as nothing in the harbor. We will take it and go on. Okay, I think I'm going to read one more. It's kind of been a, kind of a little bit of a dark reading, so <laughs> maybe going to bail out on the one I was going to read before, and maybe this one's a little more chipper. <laughs> Thank you all so much for listening. Uh, it's, it's an honor to read with young poets, and um, thank you, Jenny and Ida and Poetry. International, and the chandelier, and the pond, and everything. The Sudafed, <laughs> the Benadryl. Yeah, I went to the pharmacist right before we came over here, and I was concerned, you know, if I took Sudafed, maybe this would happen, or if I took Benadryl, that would happen, and the pharmacist was this. She said, just take, it, just take them both, they'll balance each other out. <laughs> She was just happy I didn't just pound it up and start like making it into meth, like right <laughs> Whatever. Oh, great. So this is the last poem, and uh, it's, um, you know, like I'm one of those people who when I'm walking around in the neighborhood and I see that pile of records, like LPs, and I have to go through it just in case there's like some earth, wind, fire record or something. <laughs> you know? And so, you know, so I was doing that. I was like, you know, last year at some point I was in my neighborhood in San Francisco doing this, and uh I saw um, this record, and it was this incredible record cover. It was like this guy leaning, he was wearing a white sweater, very handsome guy, wearing a white cardigan against the door, and he had, you know, and it was, and it was the love songs of Sergio Franchi. I don't know if anybody knows who Sergio Franchi is. He was, he was like a crooner. Um, so I, you know, immediately went home. I took the record, and then I went home and like, um, you know, watched him on YouTube or whatever. He's pretty, he's great. So I decided I would write this poem for Sergio Frank. He was very struck by his, by his, just, I don't know what, his music and his, the way he looked. So I recommend you look him up. F-R-A-N-C-H-I, Frankie. All over YouTube. Thank you again for listening. To Sergio Frankie. Listening to you sing Stella by Starlight, I'm thinking of the hummingbird I actually see almost every morning hovering in the garden. I think it has a green chest, but it moves too fast to really be sure. It seems to particularly love those purple flowers, whose names, no matter how many times I am told, I cannot remember. Sergio Franchi, I am giving in to spending a long, slow hour holding a book closed in my lap and reading about your life. 
As a youth, you studied both music and engineering. I imagine in those days, you were not entirely happy. It makes sense later you would be so fearless, staring into the very hot lights on the stage of The Ed Sullivan Show, with effortless force pushing the air that made the sound so beautiful and rending, my heart and I for once agree. At that moment, not unlike a laundromat at night, your light is so artificial, it truly seems too real. And with a little sweat forming on your very sculptural forehead, it is clear, even you know, you could never prepare us for even one long, terrible afternoon. Yesterday I was walking down Stockton, avoiding the many pedestrians, crowded around the Chinese groceries, with their marvelous, enigmatic produce. I was feeling a little rage, and also some happiness, when a small gray cat, who might or might not have been lost, came up to me, and with his forehead bumped my shin. Great singer, forgive me. Being myself has been a welcome, unconscious chore. Today, when I pass a person on the street, I promise to think, you there, you could be a beautiful singer. I've carried several problems here and would like to leave them, but then who would I be? <laughs> Thanks.